What's up, guys? It's Monday morning here at Muscle Serpents Daily. And yeah, I'm in my studios. I got a lot of recording to do today, a lot of drama in the bodybuilding world. But that doesn't mean I don't have time for my snakes and reptiles. I'm going down to the snake room. I don't know what I'm going to find. I don't even know what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to just see what interests me, what might interest you, and I'll show you what I got going on. Because sometimes, you know, on a Monday, when everything's just going all kooky crazy, you got to kind of just take a step away and de-stress with your reptiles. That's what I like to do. My snakes kind of just lower my cortisol levels just low enough so that I can relax and be productive the rest of the day. And so I'm going to go downstairs. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some scaleless head stuff and talk to you about, you know, what it takes to make a scaleless head. Because as we know, or maybe we don't know, in the ball python world, the scaleless head animal is a, basically is a snake that is missing some scales on its head. And Brian Barczyk is the one who kind of originated that morph. And he said, you know, I wonder if I breed two, two animals that have scales missing on their head together, what it would produce. He didn't know if it was genetic or not. He just knew that when he took the scaleless head animal and he bred it to a regular, he got some scaleless heads and some regulars. And when he bred the, the scaleless heads together, he produced a completely scaleless animal, which made the scaleless uh, animal a incomplete dominant. The, the, when you, with the one gene copy, you have a couple scales missing. When you have both copies, two copies of the scaleless head gene, you have a completely scaleless animal. And these animals are really super cool. I produced one earlier this year. I missed on my last clutch, but I'm going to show you how to go through your clutch. And sometimes people, you know, look at a clutch and they say, this sucks. And then they, and then they just forget about it. But you got to really analyze what you got sometimes. And sometimes you find out you got more than you really think. So let's go into my steak room, see what's going on. And I hope you guys are having a great Monday. All right, so let's start here with uh, this pinstripe which looks like a normal pinstripe ball python, but it's not. This little girl here is a pinstripe scaleless head. See her scales missing. I bred her this past season, and I got a clutch that I'm gonna show you. I actually bred her to a scaleless head het pied and male. And we, we had about seven eggs that hatched. They were really good ones. I was hoping to get some scaleless from this, I got none. It was actually a very disappointing clutch. And I thought I got nothing actually. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit about how something nothing might not be nothing. And you have to really, you know, put your clutch in your, set them up and then study them as they shed. But look at her, I want you to get a good look at her head. She's scaleless head, but she's not missing a ton of scales on her head. And that's, that's an important point. Sometimes you don't see that. Now, how do you tell if you've got a scaleless head if they're not missing that many scales? Well, there's another trick, and I've showed you guys this before. If she'll cooperate, I'm going to show you it again. If you look at the vent, look at that last scale. If you look at that last scale, right there, you see how it's got a split in it? And that split is what will tell you that you've got a scaleless head. Let's cut to this terribly dissatisfying clutch that I got. <laughs> Here was like one of the first hatchlings that came out. And as you can tell, you look at the head, it, it's clearly a regular ball python. <laughs> at least that's what I thought it was initially on first inspection, you know? And of course it has the ability to be 50% head pied. I forgot that because the, the daddy was head pied. So we turn it over, doesn't seem to have any head pied markings. So we got a normal here. Disappointment, right? For most people. Okay, now we go to our next baby in this clutch. And we look at the head and we clearly see <laughs> another normal, right? We turn her over. And we really don't see too many head pied markers here as well. And so another, another disappointment, right? Now I go to my third baby, which I'm, I'm really in a bad mood at this point, right? And I say, ugh, ugh, is this gonna be another regular? But I see a little bit of a pattern, dis you know, disturbance. And I look at the head and I see a couple scales missing, scaleless head. Now, if you look at this baby, okay, 
And this is a good comparison. Let me get the other one out. Ouch. Okay. Look at these two. Okay, they're both regulars. This one's scaleless head, this one's not. You can see a definite lightening of the pattern on the scaleless head, so it definitely affects coloring. Okay, and it definitely, you can, it almost looks a little enchy-ish in its pattern, so it definitely affects pattern as well. So the scaleless head is not just missing scales. It definitely changes color and it changes pattern a little bit. Not a lot, it's subtle, but this is a much lighter snake. It almost looks pastelish, right? And it's not. Now, if we turn this guy over, okay, we see clear train tracks along the bottom right there. That's clearly het pied markers. Obviously, I wouldn't bet the bank on it, but I'm pretty 100. I'd say I'm 99% confident that this is carrying the, the pied or het pied trait. So, this one turned out to be pretty good after all was said and done, even though on first inspection it doesn't look like anything special. We got a scaleless head that's, that's probably 100% het pied. All right, now we go to this little female here, who is clearly pinstripe, but that is the most aberrant looking pinstripe I've ever seen. So now you have to say to yourself, well, is she scaleless head? Well, she's not missing a lot of scales, but she definitely looks like she's missing a couple there. And that could certainly be why this, this snake looks a little lighter than a normal pinstripe and has this really weird, look at that, it almost has like a, like a barbed wire patterning on her. Now that could be the head pied influence. If we turn her over, you know, pinstripes, they're so weird that sometimes it's hard to tell. But that actually, I would actually say that that's head pied markers. Even though they're only little dots there, they're in a, in a parallel line sequence, almost like railroad tracks. So looking at this little girl, I have a feeling we have a scaleless head, pinstripe, that's also 100% head pie. And this, this girl will be obviously a, a nice breeder, you know, we can produce some pinstripe pieds that are scaleless down the road with her. Some good potential here. So from a litter, or a clutch I should say, I always can, boas and litters, ball pythons clutches, and a lot of breeders get pissed off when you use the wrong terminology, but it's the same thing. It seems like sometimes, once again, on first inspection, when you don't really have very much of anything and you don't hit that scaleless animal, that the clutch was a disaster. But it really wasn't. I produced some really good potential here. I have a couple scaleless heads that are head pied. Whether they be males or females, I'll probably keep the females back uh, because I have a double. I have a head pied male, obviously, already. It would have been nice to have produced a visual, but maybe next year we'll go with that. This one, I really like this one. I love that. Look at that little barbed wire pattern there. Pinstripe is not my, it was never my favorite, you know, gene, but I'm, I'm actually liking it more and more, to be honest with you. Look at the tail. That's, talk about parallel lines, right? I'm always asked about my crystal, and I have to give you guys an update. This is the super labyrinth, probably super hypo boa that I produced in 2018 and he is growing at a nice rate he should be hopefully maybe ready to breed this coming season i hope so look at those blue eyes with that pink and white i mean that's that's a blue-eyed leucistic if i've ever seen it and he's got the nice pink tongue and he's just he's one of my favorites in the collection for sure and he's a good eater and i think he's I think we got him up to size. Hopefully he'll do some breeding this coming season. And the great thing about when you use a crystal to breed is everything's labyrinth, you know, assuming that everything takes. You know, boas, it's not as easy as, as ball pythons. Ball pythons, you put them together and they, and they breed, you know. Boas, there's, there's, you have to say several prayers a day, you know, to get what you want. But yeah, here he is, he's looking really good. I'm gonna finish up today's video with this little gorgeous boa I have here. You might think that there's a million genes in this girl, but there really isn't. The only gene in here is hypo. And why is this snake so red? Because it's been line bred for generation after generation after generation. There's actually two different pastel lines in here. Now the pastel line in, in boas is not a genetically inherited type thing, similar to you know pastel and ball pythons. 
pastel and, and boa just means that the, the snake has been wine bred, you know, for certain traits for many, many generations. And then they, people just kind of name it. Like Vin Russo has his Russo red line of pastel boas that are just the reddest snakes he's bred over the years, line after, generation after generation. This is the pastel flamingo line. Um, not only does it have pastel flamingo, or just we can call it flamingo pastel, it also has the red tiger line. So it's red tiger and pastel together. And it just, it's, I mean, this snake is just exquisitely red. Obviously the hypo has removed most of the dark pigments from it, but this snake is just a red, red snake. Now, I had bred this snake, this female, t with my labyrinth, hypo labyrinth earlier this year. And it just, she just didn't go. I don't know, maybe she needs another year. Uh, you know, hopefully next year she'll go. I just, I thought that, you know, these double line pastels combined with the hypogene and labyrinth would just produce some crazy labyrinths. And it didn't go. It's one of those projects. Sometimes it just doesn't work. And you have to accept that that's the way it goes. And she's got some nice size on. And I think hopefully, you know, this coming season she'll go. I did see, the funny thing is I saw a lot of locks. So I thought she was definitely going to go. But once again... Snakes are on their own timeline, and they're not on our timeline, and we have to just be patient. And look at that tail. Look at that tail. That's just a gorgeous snake. Once again, sometimes you don't need a lot of genes, you just need a lot of patience. And you get a lot of patience when you line breed generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. And I really, I take my hat off to these breeders that have the patience to do that. And, Guys like Vin Russo, who spent, you know, the last 25 years breeding the best snakes to the best snakes. Because that's something that you don't have to worry about what the genetics are. It, it, it's just going to be there. You breed a red snake that's just red with no recessive or incomplete dominant or dominant genes. That snake's always going to be red. And it's going to produce red babies. That's the way it goes. Hopefully you guys are having a great Monday. And I'm going to wrap up this video right here if you guys have not subscribed make sure you subscribe like the video tell your friends about it turn on your subscriptions guess what i'll be back tomorrow